Well, thank you everybody for coming to our latest HydroTerra webinar. Today we've got Paul Lightbody, who's the principal of Bokinya Consulting, and he's going to be talking to us about fugitive landfill gas emissions. What do the different monitoring techniques tell us? It's a topic close to my heart. Obviously, HydroTerra does a lot of landfill monitoring, and Paul is right up to speed with what's going on in that area, both from his experience, but also from traveling the world and talking and uh, uh, I guess witnessing a lot of presentations overseas. So very aware of what's going on um, and, and what's emerging as new technologies. So fantastic to have Paul here today. Uh, before we get into things, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we conduct our work across this great land, and for that privilege, we would like to thank the traditional owners. Hydroterra respectfully acknowledges the Boon people of the Kulin Nation, where we are located today, and we pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. There's a picture of Paul and myself. A little bit about our presenter. So Paul is a consulting engineer with over 30 years professional experience in landfill engineering, closure and emissions management. He did his early education in civil engineering in South Australia and then followed that up with a master's in waste management over in New South Wales. Currently a technical advisor to operators, auditors and regulators, Paul formed Mokinya Consulting in 2015 after leading the Waste and Environment Group of a national consulting practice for 20 years. He is currently chair of the Waste Management Resource Recovery Landfill Division and uh, would be known to many of you who are here today, a true expert in landfill. Before we commence our presentation, just like to remind you that we love to get your questions. And uh, in order for you to raise questions during our webinar, please use the Q&A button at the top of your screen. I will read out those questions after the early bird questions at the end of the presentation. A little bit about what motivates HydroTerra to put on these webinars. We really do like sharing knowledge and certainly um, having a speaker like Paul on board is really going to broaden a lot of people's knowledge of landfill monitoring today. We like to facilitate education and we like to be an industry leader and by bringing on other industry leaders, we learn more ourselves. Today's topic, fugitive landfill gas emissions, what do the different monitoring techniques tell us? So, Paul, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to you. Thanks, Richard. Um, it's great, great to be here and have the opportunity to, to share the content of this presentation today. Um, this is a this is quite a broad um, broad topic. I'll be covering. Um, why we actually bother to estimate emissions um, with the use of models briefly, um, the emission sources and pathways at a landfill site, and then talk through how those emissions are detected, how they're measured um, in space and quantified to a flux rate, um, and then talk through some validation studies that have been recently completed in the in North America uh particularly looking at the at the quanti quantification precision of a range of tech techniques that are now now being promoted uh, and and considered for use and then I'll just pr provide some some commentary at the end about I think where where we're at at the moment and what what might be coming Firstly, why? Why do we measure these uh, emissions? Well, you can't manage them if you don't measure them. So there's regulatory drivers um, 
commitments on my sector reductions, um, competitive differentiation or commitments, um, CSR and sustainability goals and commitments. Um, emissions can have financial equivalents or financial implications. There are disclosure obligations. Uh, there's a legislation that provides a safeguard mechanism in Australia. There are abatement credits and a need for scheme integrity around those, which relies on measurement. And the available technology allows us to monitor and measure and that um, those technologies are evolving. So what we can do with those is, is expanding. I'll touch on briefly, although this isn't the focus of the of the presentation, that models are used extensively to estimate emissions from, from landfills. When we're talking about carbon emissions or methane emissions from landfills, uh, the models typically rely on a first order decay model um, and the emissions are estimated based on a model generation less measured or estimated recovery of gas or destruction of gas through collection systems which might flare or, or convert to energy captured gas. And our Australian uh, engines reporting requirements limit recovery to 75% of model generation. Emissions vary over time based on the waste type, fractions, um, age and climate. And there's a quite a range of models. We've got engines locally, US EPA, Landgem, AlphaSorg, um, and there are others. And these models, well, all models are wrong, but some are helpful. And the errors are set out in the IPCC documentation around the use of the model for estimating waste emissions um, and all of the parameter uncertainty estimates are provided. And there's quite a wide range. Researchers have, who have studied these have, have indicated quite a wide range of under and over estimations. We're relying simply on models. The certainty we get from the use of these models is largely through their adoption for national and international reporting purposes um, and for emissions accounting, and it's provided by their inclusion in regulation. How often do you actually have um, monitoring data to be able to truly evaluate the effectiveness of these models? Look, it, it is um, something that has been studied quite in, in intensively. Um, it's the variability in waste, the composition of waste. It's, it does vary quite a lot. And the impact of climate, water practices at sites on the actual emissions. And similarly, the capture practices uh, and effectiveness vary quite a lot. So there's, there's many, many variables. Um, so whilst it can be studied and, and the uncertainty or the, the causes of uncertainty are, are identified and, and to some extent understood, it's, it's quite difficult to, to model all of that, that uncertainty with, with any precision. And the, the techniques, as we'll get into further in the presentation, to monitor whole of site emissions are actually uh, not straightforward. Yeah. Shall I move to the next slide? Yes, thanks. Landfill emissions um, come from a wide range of sources on a landfill site, potentially. Um, in the photograph of a, this is of a large site, you can see and I've labelled areas which are the active face or the active tipping area of the landfill where emissions tend to be high, particularly where the gas collection systems that may be present are taken offline during periods of filling. Um, in the bottom half of the image is the, the sloping batters of the landfill where emissions may be significant because of the lower compaction of cover soils and, and possibly the absence of gas collection systems on the slopes 
the intermediate cover areas um, allow some better control and the final cover or engineered temporary covers, in this case on the left, a, a GM membrane, um, give good control of emissions. They limit the air ingress when a site's under extraction or under vacuum and and prevent act as a barrier to prevent direct emissions. There's a lot of point sources on a landfill as well. Um, there can be some some uh, emissions, residual emissions from combustion in flares and engines, leaks from the gas collection system, pipework and wells, uh, point source emissions that occur during the construction of wells. When you're drilling a gas well, there's a release of gas prior to the well being installed and sealed. Leachate sumps can be just a, an opening into the landfill if they're not effectively sealed or a damage can, can vent uh, the landfill gas um, and there can be some loss of gas from the leachate treatment system as well. There can be other sources on a, on a site as well. There can be with uh, poor barriers or lack of liners, uh, my, subsurface migration and other co-located activities such as composting, which should be aerobic and, and shouldn't be generating methane. Um, monitoring of sites has, in fact, identified they can be significant sources if they're not being well operated or run. Um, and just to give some perspective, if uh, you know if a landfill site's got a, a flare or an engine that's using a thousand cubic meters an hour of captured landfill gas, and there's a seventy five percent capture efficiency, that's still uh, an emission of three hundred cubic meters an hour of gas at fifty percent methane. That's that's 200 odd kilograms an hour of, of methane emission. Next Why slide. Why settled on that oh. 75%? Well, like, well, as an example, as like seems to be coming up under the Angus thing and as well. What's Look, I, I put 75% in because that's what Engers limits the capture rate to in the in the use of that model. Um, yeah. Is that on a full on a fully closed site, it is it, it can be higher than that, and on an operating site, it can be lower. This was just really just to give some perspective as to, um, and for comparison as we go into some of the later uh, validation studies, what uh, and some of the the reported emissions from from landfills, just to just to indicate where where a, a site might sit. Okay, thank you. I've just got a couple of slides now to uh, which have considered whole of site emissions and done. These are intense model modelings. Uh, sorry, direct model measurement or monitoring studies to assess um, whole of site emissions. Uh, there's two examples here. Uh, the first is a is a Danish landfill. It's closed site with a soil cover and no gas collection system. And it was studied using eddy covariance um, and whole of site tracer dilution methods, which we'll cover um, what that is a little bit later. And looking at whole of site emissions, the chart on the top right shows a relationship between the, the rate of change in atmospheric pressure and flux from the, from the landfill. There was quite a significant fluctuation in the site emissions with changes to atmospheric pressure. Um, in this case, um, site-based empirical emissions models could be developed. Um, and these models were in fact used in this case to study the oxidation efficiency of the cover system. Um, and by comparison of before and after studies and looking at the emissions with a, um, a a climatic record that gave the variation or the variational fluctuations in atmospheric pressure over time calculated a, an oxidation efficiency in this case of around 50 percent um, what's what's key here is that there's been two methods used that show that um, that correlation with changes in atmospheric pressure um, and their whole of site emissions, so they're, they're um, nulling out the 
the spatial variabilities across the, the surface of the site. They're looking at the the downwind effect um, and de total emission from the site. So climate is a big driver, uh, particularly where there's not a not a an active gas system. This is another study in the US looking at a, an active landfill in this case without a collection system and a just over a half a meter or 600 millimeter intermediate soil cover. Again, using similar methods uh, downwind to look at whole of site emissions. And again, there was an um, identified variations with atmospheric pressure, but also a strong diurnal variation across the full spectrum of the day. And what was highlighted in this case is there was a tendency to have higher emissions during the daytime when the emissions monitoring studies would typically be done and a lower emission through the overnight and early morning period, which potentially introduced a bias where data is taken from a, a point in time and extrapolated over a 24 hour period or longer to estimate a total emission. This data, um, again, is site specific. It probably only applies to this case where the landfill that doesn't have a final cover and there's no gas collection system. Um, the implications and impacts of gas collection are being further studied. This work is, is ongoing. Next slide. Go back now to methods of detection of emissions from landfills. There are a whole array of sensors that are tuned to detect methane specifically, uh, spectrometers, both using um, reflected light and, and laser to determine absorbance of um, light in a, in a column. Um, and are quite good at calculating a concentration or a column concentration of methane. These instruments can be um, airborne, laboratory, handheld, or satellite based. Um, LIDAR measures absorption of pulsed light at specific wavelengths. Uh, these are more proprietary instruments and require extensive processing to retrieve a, a column concentration. Um, flame ionisation uh, methods um, and the tuned laser diode methods can also uh, provide quite um, portable instruments for measuring absorption. And there are a range of metal oxide sensors that change resistance of a heated element due to absorption of a target gas. These are um, quite inexpensive and can be sensitive, but have a tendency to be a little bit unpredictable. Um, this is just a very high level um, snapshot of the, the techniques available. And what I want to move on now and discuss is how we actually move the sensor or locate the sensor across a landfill, which is a very large area to uh, detect methane. Um, Traditionally, we've put the instruments at fixed locations. Um, and we get a concentration at a point in time and space. The locations are maybe systematic or judgment-based, and they tended to be boreholes or wells or flux chambers to measure uh, emissions through, through covers. These are monitored um, either through monitoring events, uh, maybe continuously in the, terms, in, in the case of boreholes, um, but they provide limited spatial quantification. There's high spatial variability because of the, the conditions into which the a, a bore might be installed or the variability in a cover or a surface where a flux chain is applied. So um, borehole monitoring is probably best used to target the sources or pathways, uh, particularly subsurface migration pathways for detection of gas. And flux chambers, whilst they do have applications for for estimating diffuse emissions or diffusion through through covers, um, probably suffer in in 
you know, how many flux chamber readings do you need across a very large surface? That's quite variable. To have some confidence, you, you've captured the uncertainty and variability in that emission. So th these are the more traditional techniques. And let's move on to the next slide, Richard. Do you, do you think before we do, do you think um, even your earlier slide that shows where, you know, that lateral migration is such a small portion of methane emission versus some of the others, do you think the emphasis on having all these perimeter wells and monitoring that is maybe out of whack with the reality of the emissions? I think it's a different question with subsurface emissions there is a, a, you know, a hazard and a and a potential risk of migration into into structures or buildings or infrastructure where there could be a risk of, um, you know, an explosion risk or an asphyxiation risk. So that's quite a, a specific uh, potential risk that um, you know does justify that sort of uh, targeted monitoring. What these what monitoring bores and the focus on those doesn't do is deal with the questions around total site emissions or emissions of methane uh, as a greenhouse gas. Do you think and that's that's a, I think that's a different that's a different question. Yeah. yeah, now that's a fair point. Do you think there's insufficient monitoring going on for the total emissions side of things? Uh, that's where there's a lot of focus at the moment because that the te the techniques to do that uh, are a new and there is a lot of uncertainty with them and then how that information is is um produced and presented is is what i'll be talking about through the the rest of the presentation to move to the next slide <laughs> <laughs> oh, for some reason it's not letting me all right there we go so particularly with the emergence of um, instruments which are smaller and portable, we've ta taken to moving the sensors around the site to take the concentration data at a point in space, locate that using GPS and GIS and map the emissions across the site. So there is the case where there might be fixed towers or fixed instruments around the site and data captured as the wind direction changes and statistical methods used um, to capture, a, you know, high, you know, high frequency and high densities of data. Um, we've taken to walking instruments around sites um, using motorized vehicles or or drones um, on driving them around the perimeter of sites and putting the instruments in UAVs and aircrafts and flying around some distance from the site looking at regional impacts um, and putting the instruments in, in low earth satellites. This is allowed, uh, allows us to both do ad hoc monitoring at a high frequency or repeatedly, um, and particularly with fixed sensors, uh, continuous monitoring of sites. What, um, like locating the sources of emissions and identifying higher concentrations does, is allow us to um, locate or find and then come up with a solution to fix uh, a leak or an emission or a high emission zone in a landfill. To actually estimate the flux rate or the emission rate from a site requires post-processing of the measured data. And there's a range of models or techniques used to do that. Um, one of the earliest to be used is a Gaussian dispersion model, which is a classical model. I think it, if my memory serves me correct, was developed to, um, to predict, um, gas migration in the first world war in the, in the trenches and to come up with techniques for understanding that dispersion. Those techniques, uh, are used to if you like, back calculate the emission from downwind detected uh, emissions on a site. It un requires an understanding of the behaviour of the, that dispersion under different atmospheric conditions, the, you know, the different stability classes 
Um, and those techniques are quite well established and, and understood. And they're, whilst there are a lot of limitations to those, those limitations are quite well understood. Um, some maths balance methods are used as well, particularly with aerial methods where you can rapidly develop a by flying around a site at varying heights, producing a vertical wall or curtain around a site uh, with varying concentrations and with an understanding of the wind field across the site, calculate a mass balance um, and a, an emission rate for a site at a point in time. The tracer correlation or tracer dispersion methods um, have been reasonably well developed um, and used with good confidence to assess holocyte emissions where you've got access to the perimeter of the site and can, can drive a vehicle around with, with the instruments in it and use acetylene gas as a tracer and look at the ratio of methane to the tracer gas concentrations. So you're calibrating the dispersion model that's used to improve the, the accuracy and the confidence in the emission estimate for the whole of the site. Um, there's a, those methods have been published and are, and are widely used by researchers in particularly in Northern Europe and North America. Um, and the time-based dispersion model using stationary sensors I mentioned earlier, um, high-frequency data, um, we can use or the, use statistics to reduce the uncertainty in the predicted um, flux estimates using those techniques. Quite com computationally intensive. Um, the behaviour of the models and dealing with the real world conditions on site is where some of the challenges lie with these. And it's why the tracer correlation methods um, probably shine as the as the as the, the best methods available currently, because the the use of the tracer actually allows some calibration or in, or enhancement of the model um, to a specific site. Has anyone done and Tracer tests in Australia. Um, I'm aware. I think of one instance. There, there may be more. There, they've only been done, as I understand it, in a in a research environment. Um, they're not. They're not done. Certainly not in Australia, but they are commercially available in in Northern Europe and North America. Um. There have been attempts to use this, the large databases of surface emissions monitoring that's been done from walkover surveys or flying flying drones around, mapping the surface of landfills. Um, this technique has basic, is basically a best fit technique that assumes that the detected, um, detected elevated concentrations are a receptor. You know, it, supposes that there's a source that creates creates that impact and constructs uh, an optimization problem and then solves that through an algorithm to best fit sources to the observed emissions. Um, again, this is very computationally intensive. There has been work done to, to validate this with trace correlation methods at a few sites. Um, it's it's uh sits sits within a in a research environment at the moment um it's probably been um hasn't got as as much attention at the moment given the focus on the remote sensing techniques that are now uh getting a lot more widely available and being promoted pretty pretty heavily um but there ha there has been a fair investment into this into this technique um the method limitations i'm not sure are as well understood um and it, it was really an attempt to to use the existing uh, or legacy data that's been captured and try and process that. Uh, it's pretty hard to confirm, isn't it, whether one method's accurate versus another? 
I like them turns face to be under measure it. Uh, I think you'll see that the trace correlation method in the research that uh, is presented um, is commonly the benchmark technique that's used to to try and validate some of the remote the other remote sensing techniques. Okay. So, just just to delve a little bit further into the challenges of these this post processing, the wind field around a landfill site. Um, is complex. Landfills are big. The terrain can be complex. Largely, it's an area source and the flux rates can be quite low and variable. Do we actually have wind data that's um, sufficiently, with sufficient fidelity to actually do the calculations that are required, both spatially and temporally? Um, good questions. <laughs> It's just, it's just helpful to understand that uncertainty. Um, just go to the next slide. One of the um, one of the vendors, Stiffer Robotics, has, has just done a summary of the, the different remote sensing techniques from low earth satellites to aircraft at different elevations to drones at quite close to the surface. And they attempted to summarize the spatial resolution and the resolution of if the available wind data um, and then the temporal resolution of both of those to, to show that the further away from the site you are um, probably the less precise your data is for doing these calculations and the closer you are potentially the higher the the fidelity of the data. So I, th I think the the implication is um, you, ne you need da local data to get a higher precision in, in estimates. Still a lot of difficulties in flying instruments around in drones or UOVs to get accurate wind data. Um, the, the instruments are probably still a little, little bit large to get good wind field data from from drones um, but that may be possible um, and the, just probably the other thing to note is that different vendors use different methods and techniques some are not publicly available and some are open source um, but there are a range of techniques being used this is a very busy slide but it's an attempt to highlight and display um, that all of the techniques need to be considered as a system of measurement. In terms of designing such a system, um, obviously there's a fair bit of expertise required there and a, a broad range of knowledge. Is there anywhere, are they sort of standardising at all? Like, as you say, it's a busy slide. Is there... Look, uh, maybe if I just step through it, Richard, uh, sort of at a, at a top line are the sensors. Um, the next level down is to think about, well, how, how do we move the sensors around to, to capture the emissions across the site? And at that point, we've... If the, our outcome is to find so that we can focus on fixing a point source emissions or a high area source emission, we can do that by just moving a sensor around a site. If we actually want to, if our outcome is actually to get a, an emission rate estimate, we need to post-process that data using, using models and, and wind data to estimate a rate emission. Uh, I think that's one takeaway from this from this presentation of the system. Which system do you pick? Which system you pick depends on what your outcome or your objective is. Is it to find high emissions, or is it to actually estimate and quantify those emissions? They're, they're different questions, and you'll probably choose a different system depending on what what your objective is. Yeah, I've highlighted in the in the shaded areas just for completeness, where the 
the majority of the historical monitoring has been. It's been boundary compliance, which is monitoring bores for uh, estimating risk to risk of uh, impacts on infrastructure and surface emissions monitoring, which has been walkover surveys to detect high emission zones and use of flux chambers to attempt to quantify emissions through covers. And there's been some extrapolation of that historically to estimate rate emissions from sites. And then everything to the left, which is unshaded, is where all of the the development work and research work has been going to look at um, high frequency whole of site um, emissions to get you know, high, you know, high fidelity in the location and techniques to develop estimates of emission rate. But again, emphasize it's a system. It's not a sensor. It's not a it's not how you move it around. It's not drones. It's not a sensor and it's not a model. It's how you use each of those elements to answer the question. So you need to be clear of what you're trying to achieve. Are there any standards emerging that for whole of site? The tracer dispersion models are probably the best defined and published, or the tracer correlation methods. Um, all of the other techniques really sit within a research domain, and many of them are, and their validation uh, are published, um, but they're not widely available as a method. The US EPA is reviewing their methods at the moment and looking at expanding the methods that they publish to 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 deal with surface emissions monitoring and and estimates of emissions from landfills um, there are techniques which have been standardized and published for the more conventional surface emission monitoring and the boundary compliance monitoring um, the highlighted areas on this on this figure I move to the next slide. Thanks. So this is a snapshot of just a high level comparison of commonly available techniques that are being looked at at the moment. This was prepared by David Risk at Flux Lab uh, in Canada. And the systems are, are, are broadly the satellite based sensors, um, aircraft based sensors, um, improvements that can be achieved with LIDAR, um, the truck-based Gaussian plume calculation and tracer correlation methods, and fixed sensors. And what David did was use a bit of judgment and some, some experience to sort of look at the quantification errors, snapshot quantification errors, um, which is the second column the minimum detection limit or the emission rates that could be detected by the different methods. Uh, and you'll note that the further away the sensor gets, the the higher those thresholds become. Um, and cost. And some of the key limitations, like for the satellite-based systems that rely on spectrometers, um, if you can't see the ground, they don't work. And they probably you know need daylight to work as well. Um, getting good wind data is common, and understanding the wind and topographical effects. Um, and as you get closer to the ground, how you access some of these large sites, physical access to the surface is difficult um, on an operating landfill. It can be unsafe and hazardous in its in its own right. So you can see that the. A number of the methods are still R and D orientated. The satellite-based methods at the higher detection limits are, you know, they're they're up there and they're established and available. Um, the, the the challenge is the higher higher limits. Big sensors um, are, are emerging and quite quite promising. I just thought it would be useful just to show some examples of presentation of the data. On the left is a, a walkover track produced using a GPS um, in tandem with a sensor. Uh, tracking over, in this case, it's a 50 
50 or 60 hectare landfill site. Just highlight that the presentation here, you know, it's important to show the track so you can actually see where, see and reproduce the, the walkover um, and to show the data at all of the points, not just where it exceeds 500 ppm or some other threshold because it's actually seeing the concentrations below the threshold is also important if you're trying to understand the site and where there might be an emerging issue. Um, the right-hand side, this is just a, a selection of images from some work Carbon Mapper did in North America in 2022, where they use aerial surveys, not the satellite-based data, to lower the detection limits and actually start to show plumes at a lower detection threshold across landfills in North America. So quite uh, visually impressive. You, you you see a plume overlaying a site, so they're, they're, they're high impact um, visual presentation of the, of the data. But this is concentration data. Um, I thought I'd just delve into the presentation of the, some of the carbon mapper data as well to highlight that it includes both aerial and satellite survey data. Um, and, and if you go into the specific sites where, where there's plumes being detected, on the left you can see, and you might not be able to read it, but I've just highlighted in red that there's the number of observations, whether they're aerial or satellite based, um, and the number of uh, plumes detected and the number of null detections. And so in this case, this is a large landfill site in, Cal in San Diego in California. That's It's 250 kilograms an hour emission rate from a quite a large landfill. So that's reasonably low detection threshold. If you think back to the earlier number of, you know, hundreds of kilograms a hectare from a from a mid-sized landfill, um, you, you can detect that. Um, in this case, because there was a low detection threshold, there was actually a high persistence. So the plumes were being detected on repeat visits to the site. The top right, there's a you know a large Middle Eastern landfill where the persistence was actually quite low. It's only 22%. The Average rate or the estimated rate was just under a thousand, but individual values were five thousand and three thousand kilograms an hour. Um, so that's possibly an artifact of the high detection threshold, the low persistence. Um, What's the definition of persistence? Persistence is um, repeat. You know, if you if you're flying the site over and over again, do you always find a plume? So in, in the, this in this case, the of the on the screen there, there was um, what five five um, snapshots taken, and only two of them um, was a plume detected, but that was at a at quite a high threshold. So that so that indicates a low persistence. But I'd suggest if you had a lower detection thre threshold, that persistence would rise. Yeah. Carbon Mapper um, introduced this, this notion of persistence because um, I think that's, it's a nod to the, to the uncertainty in the, in the flux rate estimates. Um, and what they're saying is, well, are these emissions persisting over time? Is it just a, a short duration pulse or is it an ongoing and continuous emission? Landfill sources um, from where they've done tend to be more persistent because the sites are always emitting some infrastructure related losses from from the oil and gas sector they tend to be very um, short-lived they can be a fault or a failure or a leak that gets repaired so their persistence tends to be lower um, carbon mapper have also flagged um, adding a bit more transparency from the source sites to say whether there was a, a reason or any conditions that might have given rise to an emission that they detect. Um, again, to it's it's a it's a recognition that the persistence might be low or high, 
or it might be an incident, not a not a persistent emission of it that's been captured. So they're, they're considering adding some further transparency to that, around that to the site. Um, so the, the, so are these images we're looking at here, are these of uh, landfills or they're of um, like coal seam gas sites? Or? The, the two at the top are both solid waste sites. The, the one at the lower right, which you, you can't really see, um, I've put up just, that's the Australian um, landscape in Carbon Mapper. The sites, because they're all satellite based, um, are all coal, coal mines. Okay. There's there's no landfills currently in the carbon mapper data set that's that's publicly facing from Australia. I think that's largely because it's all satellite based. I don't think they've done any aerial work locally. It's interesting. Um, so, has this been applied to the coal seam gas side of things, like up in the Surat Basin? Do you know? Or... Uh, Yes, that's the New South Wales component. There, there's a couple more sites up in up in Queensland that are visible as well. Okay. Um, and these techniques, a lot of the work is actually um, being done in uh, targeted at the the oil and gas sector. Um, the waste sector is really inheriting the benefit of a large investment that's been put into the developing these techniques for that sector. Yeah. Let's move on. Thanks. So back in 2022, um, Waste Management in the US did a large study across a number of its sites of a range of techniques. Um, they commented that, that it was uh, a large project, difficult to manage and very expensive. Um, I think it was, it was upwards of a, might have been 10 or a dozen sites. And they were comparing tracer correlation method, um, GHG, SAT, drones, carbon mapper, aerial, um, fluxes from surface emissions and fixed towers on their sites. Um, one of the big takeaways was that all the methods weren't applied at the same time, so they weren't actually looking at a con at the same emission. And because the there's this temporal variation and a diurnal variation in emissions, it wasn't possible from this work to directly compare the emissions at the same time. And they also identified from being the operator of the sites that actually understanding the flux rates from these that were that were me measured or estimated, actually understanding what was going on in the landfill was key because the operational stages of the collection system, construction activities, cover uh, extent and local meteorology conditions were all factors that they could see or attribute to the some of the variability they were seeing. The the fixed sensors and the drone flux approaches they thought showed a lot of promise, um, but still um, not really ready for prime time, needed a bit more work. Um, so following this work, if you just move to the next slide, um, industry funded a, a the Environmental Research and Education Foundation, which is a not-for-profit in the US, to scope and fund a controlled release study. Um, in in it was actually in Canada, just out of Toronto, but it was the North American waste sector um, funded this work. Um, and the the problem they were trying to consider was um, how how reliable or how much confidence should the industry take from these methods? Are, are they are they ready to be let outside of a research environment given the multiple sources of uncertainty and temporal variability um, that's present? So this was a, a blind trial where a controlled release of methane was undertaken. It was undertaken in Canada because the regulator would allow it to occur. They couldn't actually get those permissions as easily in the US because it's a rec it is directly emitting methane. Um, they don't like the term sheet out, but it really was a, a vendor, op an opportunity for vendors to monitor the site simultaneously with these controlled blind emission rates to see what they could detect. There was 16 participants 
um, all, pretty much all of the methods were were tested. Um, it included some which were still in the developmental stage, but it included them also the more common techniques and one satellite vendor. Next slide. Now, I'll run through some charts now, which is the preliminary publication of the outcomes of these trials, which are, which were uh, made public in late February of this year. Um, this work was done in the in the latter half of 2023. Um, it's a series of plots that show the on the x-axis the actual flux rates, controlled release amounts from from the ground, and they were both area and point source emissions, and the measured on uh, by the each technique on the y-axis. They're presented with error bars, the horizontal bars being the uncertainty in release rate and the vertical bars, the vendor uncertainty. There's a, a line of best fit provided and an indication of bias as whether the, the line of best fit is above or below the one in one. So I'll just step through these quick and provide some comments from at, the, at the tail end. The preliminary findings were, were pretty good, um, all things considered. The truck-based um, measurements would, because of the constraints of the tile, would actually reduce um, from doing them over hours that it would normally take to, to 30 minutes. This site was one they had good access to and could could rush around in, this, in the vehicles. Um, they just qualify that, that might have led, led to a little bit of increased variance with these methods. But the bottom right, the tracer correlation methods gave the, the best results, which was probably to be expected um, given the history with that method and the, the inherent um, calibration that the use of a tracer provides. Um, the aerial LIDAR method up on the top right tended to overestimate slightly. Um, and the, the straight Gaussian methods um, with the truck-based sensors produce just higher variance than those methods using a, a, a tracer. Um, the other um, comment that was made was that vendors using the same techniques and same sensors um, weren't reproducible. There was high variability, um, both the highest and lowest R squares from two vendors using different, uh, using ostensibly the same sensors and, and techniques. That the reasons for that aren't understood, that's probably still subject to some, some discussion and investigation. Um, the, that's the top two charts. The, the lower two were the fixed uh, fixed instruments and continuous monitoring. Uh, these instruments are quite cheap, but they're still showing uh, a high variability uh, in the in, in the estimates provided by those techniques. Uh, this is just another takeaway that using local weather data improved accuracy. Um, on the left is LIDAR in a light aircraft, and on the right, uh, using using generalised wind data, and on the right is the improved estimates after site-specific wind data was, was used in the computations. Next slide. But the summary was that all, all of the techniques were within you know, 1.8 times that diurnal range of variation in landfill flux rates. Uh, the time of day and repetitions across the time of day probably matter more than the method because of the variability that can occur in the, in the wind and possibly the emissions from the surface. Um, there was a satellite vendor. There was no chart because although the, the limits of emission from this trial were about 100 kilograms an hour, as an area source, the satellite 
used in this case couldn't couldn't detect that. Could have de probably detected it if it was a point source, but couldn't detect it as an as an area source. Uh, and the current current satellites probably need more than three hundred kilograms an hour uh, of emission to be able to pick it up. The um, tuned laser diode systems do detect diffuse emission sources um, above 10 kilograms an hour quite easily. Um, and LIDAR is, is very effective, but even down to one kilograms an hour, including the area sources. So LIDAR is going to improve the performance of, of the satellite data. Slider the... always have to be mounted on like aircraft and that sort of thing, or can you have it as a fixed device? Probably possible to do it in a fixed installation. That um, it's probably a cost benefit. That might work for a, sort of a research study. I think lidar would probably not not be cost effective on a on a single site. Right. Um, this report, well, this information is due to be reported. I think within about a month's time. So it's this space. Um, I thought I'd just reflect a little bit more on, you know, modeling or, or measurement. Um, there's probably a large degree of error in a model or a single snap, snap, snapshot measurement. Uh, they've probably both got similar large error potential. You know, extrapolating snapshot just compounds the error. If you pick a high emission time of day and then extrapolate that over the year, that bias is is introduced to the an annual estimate, and that can be significant. And there's probably no absolute rule on which measurement technique will have the lowest rate of estimate error. It really depends on the site and the applicability or suitability of method to that that instance. Um. It's probably there's probably no clear winner at the moment, um, and I just question. You know, we we probably shouldn't be as confident in the repeatability of our model models, particularly the regulatory models, where we don't actually understand or know the accuracy in the applica in in site specific applications. Just because we model again and again doesn't make the make the result any more accurate. Um, but unlike models. You know, a high frequency of measurement can actually um, reduce the uncertainty, and we can use statistics to better understand that. Next slide. Interesting, just to reflect on that. But so, the fixed instruments that can measure at high frequency might be the winner ultimately. It seems like. I that think that's good. that's certainly where there's. Where there's potential, and I think uh, um, if the the sensors can be um, made a little bit more reliable, that's that's clearly a, a direction that's probably got a a good price point um, and good apl applicability on a on a site from an operator's perspective. Um, so, just in summary. At present, we can already detect emissions at very low flux rates using existing site-based methods. A TDL can be carried around a site and is very sensitive. Uh, this is normally sufficient to find hot emission hotspots so you can get on and fix them. Um, we can measure the land captured landfill gas accurately as well. So if you improve capture, that should be directly measurable through higher flows of gas to a flare or an engine. Currently, I think we can only quantify emissions accurately in, as a snapshot. Uh, maybe we can calibrate a semi-empirical model on a, on a site uh, to account for those diurnal variations. And certainly the, some of the Danish researchers believe they can do that on some of their sites. Um, but again, the sort of apparent comfort in models that are continue, you know, we can confidently predict they'll repeat the same answers, but we don't really know how accurate they are. Um, and in the future, 
you know, the remote sensors are going to improve in sensitivity. There's really going to be no hiding at the, from, from those uh, remote sensing, particularly the satellites. Um, on the ground validation is essential to really quantify what's happening on a site. Um, the remote sensors might indicate persistence of a, of a high emission, but the absolute estimates are still going to be um, subject to a bit of a bit of um, oh, yeah, criticism. Um, the low uncertainty in annual estimates is going to going to be a persistent challenge. And to that, your earlier observation, Richard, the systems with high repetition and low cost and speed might be more important in the future. So fixed sensors or, or maybe the um, drone-based sensors with processing and, and better wind data um, might be where, where we see the real progress. The satellites and airborne systems are certainly going to shine a spotlight on emissions, but in terms of understanding the magnitude of them and their persistence over time is going to require the site-based data. Are the regulators putting much pressure on to and who is the relevant regulator i suppose for these total emissions um, are they are they driving the change in the way we're doing in australia oh very good questions um there are mo the pressures coming from many directions the different regulators are involved um, some of the pressure is actually going to come from the um, the reporting requirements for large organisations to report their emissions um, and their scope three emissions, and to do so without greenwashing or and and with um, you know, with truth in reporting or integrity in reporting requirements also being being promoted through corporate regulators um, in Australia our our national regulator and our state EPAs um, have a different focus with landfill emissions. One's health and risk-based. Uh, the federal regulator's taken the lead in carbon emissions because that's a national a national role, um, notwithstanding that the New South Wales EPA has recently amended the Act to bring it uh, bring it within within the scope of the of the Act in New South Wales. Um, similar issues in in other jurisdictions in the US. Um, there's a range of um, degrees of focus across the US. One of the one of the um, warnings or, or challenges that they've foreshadowed is the it's very difficult to work across, or certainly for the waste sector, working across multiple jurisdictions to deal with different uh, regulators requiring different re requirements. Across different jurisdictions. Um, so the federal agency that is responsible in Australia, do you know its name? Oh, it's the uh, the climate change regulator, the, the clean energy regulator. Was it? Decker. All right. So, yeah, I d should just acknowledge in, in concluding, uh, certainly um, David Risk at Flux Lab um, has been quite helpful in providing some insight and, and several discussions now about this. Um, EREF, who, who was industry funded to undertake particularly those, um, those recent studies, there's a range of published work from Florida State University, Sniffer Robotics, University of Delaware and others, um, and discussions with many of the authors specifically mentioned on the way through the presentation, uh, particularly the, the Danish or the DTU academics um, and, and others. Well, that was excellent. I'm going to move straight to the early bird questions because uh, we're a bit short on for time. Are you happy to keep going for another half yep. hour or so? Thanks Indeed. very much. It's fantastic. Um, okay. Thank you, everybody, for your early bird questions. There's quite a lot here. How do the techniques compare when trying to distinguish waste sourced emissions from background levels? Oh, look, it can be an issue. The, the methods can't distinguish 
um, necessarily you need to understand how you apply the method to the site, whether there's off-site sources um, and whether you need to separately quantify those so you can deduct them or, or uh, acknowledge that there, there are other contributing factors. The mass methods may may be able to 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 cancel those out, but but yes, it's a need to understand the site. Yeah, I remember with some gas clam data we were collecting at a particular site, and I think we ended up using some kind of isotope sort of approach to look at variance in sources. The um, you can get naturally occurring methane from like old stream sediments that are now subsurface. And everyone thought it was landfill gas, but it, but it wasn't. These things get in the way. <laughs> Question number two, what are the inhibitors to the monitoring, such as temperature, pressure, leachate, other weather effects? I think we've covered some of those. Probably primarily that just physically moving the sensor around, so site, site access, uh, and then whether there's a there's something phys physically stopping the method from working. Um, and moisture can affect some sensors, but uh, uh, LIDAR and, and you know, spectrometers rely on being able to see the surface as well. So uh, cloud cover, snow cover, you know, absence of sunlight, if that's the light source for the, the spectrometer, um, can, can be issues. Um, and wind data, you know, having good, good wind data, site-specific wind data is important. To get to get um, better better estimates. So when you talk about good wind data, I know you can get sort of microclimate stations and things versus just a standard. But what what do you say when you say good wind data? What's your appropriate to the site and the conditions? A complex site with you know really unstable atmospheric conditions might be quite hard to do if it's all averaged up into a three kilometer pixel of a, of a global climate model. Um, whereas if the conditions are very, uh, very predictable and stable, that might be okay. Next question. What are the causes for landfill gas catching fire inside a closed landfill? Bad compaction efforts, type of waste? Oh, for ignition, you need oxygen and an ignition source. Uh, so, you know, poor cover and and a poorly operated gas system that's drawing air in through the cover or another, another or just air ingress through an absence of cover. And you know, batteries or something else could give rise to a, an, an ignition source or you know, create an, an ignition source and a fire that sets the gas off. A lot of landfill fires are actually um, not gas fires, they're just fires on the surface of the landfill as well. Okay. Are we seeing a lot more yeah. landfill fires because of change in the batteries we're using? I'm seeing a yeah. It's a it's a global problem, particularly with uh, lithium ion batteries in small disposable items like like vapes, but also all manner of other uh, goods that are finding their way into the residual waste stream. So it's more important than ever to keep them out. Next question. What are your thoughts on utilising telemetry systems in finding hotspots that are then verified with accepted monitoring methods? When they say telemetry, maybe they mean um, remote. Uh, I was, I'd interpreted that, interpreted that as being the, more, the high frequency fixed sensor type installations around a site oh, okay. right. to um, to spot a, a, a higher emission pulse on a site and then you then you go and look I, that was that conversation towards the end Richard I think those methods um, are going to have appeal for operators uh, because they're they're cheaper they're near real time and they're high frequency um, So well, they're, they're good for managing a site, but maybe not um, so much for doing this overall flux estimation. 
Look, I think they'll have an early application in just spotting change and, yeah. and the, their use may improve as the techniques and sensors improve for, for estimating fluxes as well. But if you if you can find the changes and the, the high emission zones and just get on and do something about them, the, you know, the emissions reduce. So that sort of looks after itself if you if you find and fix, um, which is the message that industry, particularly in the US, is pushing back and saying we emission limits are one thing, but they're because it's so hard to measure. The focus really needs to be on what is an appropriate, what is a, a, an appropriate, timely, and appropriate response in response to identifying a, a hot spot or a high emission zone. Yeah. Next question. What is the current opinion view from the EPA about using the aerial satellite platforms for landfill compliance monitoring? I'll let the EPA speak for themselves. But you know, <laughs> I, I, I think they need to use the tools available to gather intelligence as part of their role. Um, but I'd ask, you know, what is actually the compliance standard? for some of these techniques. Yeah. It's coming, isn't it? But it's still a way off. Yes. Um, any update recommendations, RE monitoring adjacent, brackets, residential areas, sites in a fractured basalt terrain setting? Oh, I wouldn't provide an update. I'd say it's nothing's changed, but I understand the source and the pathway. Do the under investigations necessary to to understand those um, and monitor the pathway and the receptor, not just at the receptor, which just goes to developing the conceptual site model and actually probably understanding that. So you're monitoring in the right right locations and validating the absence uh, and validating the the CSM. Any view on whether that should be continuous or spot measurement? Depends how long you've got. If you want to do it quickly, you really need to use continuous monitors. Anyone that's looked and compared continuous data to event-based monitoring data can see how what you miss between events. And you can't get confidence after you've seen that with a handful of discrete monitoring events. Um, you probably need you know six months to a year of regular monitoring and and some targeted monitoring and and validation you've actually got the the high risk atmospheric conditions captured during those events otherwise you've missed what might be important yeah what are the limitations challenges in comparison between the different continuous gas analyzers Oh, that's probably a bit a bit difficult without going into into tin tax. Um, I'd just say correct installation. The challenges I've seen would be actually um, thinking of the whole monitoring um, or your your monitoring as a as a system. You know, what what's the CSM? Where are the system boundaries? Where are you actually monitoring in that system? Is the gear installed correctly? Calibrated and have you got appropriate QAQC? Yeah, I could probably add to this. So the common ones on the market. Um, well, the first one was the gas clam. Its limitations uh, that it has only got a certain power supply, so you have to go out and change the batteries every two to four weeks. Um, we can customize telemetry for it these days, but. Uh, it doesn't come with flux. Uh, it doesn't come with a flow meter, so you need an auxiliary flow meter to use it that way. Um, Ambisense, it's telemetered. Um, it needs to be mounted on the surface, so it's not in a borehole. Um, so they're the two main common continuous monitors at the moment. A, a degree absence of absence of flow rates from boreholes or good flow data is um, is it is an issue where you've got a gassing site and you, you actually need to, to investigate it. You do need good flow data. Yeah. So the ambient sense will give you um, 
reasonably high frequency measurements of flow. But you can't have it going every couple of minutes because you'll run the power down too much. So you sort of have some limitations in the frequency there. But, um, if you want to know more about that, give us a call, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's, Richard, I'm sure you can help as well with um, how you physically install and secure those instruments because locating them where you want to get the measurements is, is quite often a, the, one of the bigger parts or bigger challenges of actually setting up a monitoring system, um, particularly if you're, if you're off-site. And making sure you're doing the um, well integrity test too is important. Um, the use a helium shroud and, and check for that can also be important. So that's that's more about I guess the condition of the well itself, but it is something to keep an eye on. Installing something like a continuous monitoring ambisense, you're better off to get someone else to install it like us um, than trying to do it yourself. Is just a general rule. Um, we used to rent them out just as a rental, but better to do it, get it done properly. Um, next dot point. Thanks for sharing your wisdom. Put on your pull. <laughs> How do you address landfill contaminants, transit migration to obtain a representative state? Look, if you just limit that to the the fugitive gas emissions, um, it, I hope this presentation is just emphasise that you actually need to understand the system and the very but inherent variability um, and depending on your, the question you've actually got or your need, look at the frequency of data capture that you require to answer the cost, uh, answer the question um, and, and apply appropriate techniques. To... It's a really good question because it leads to what happens with nearly all monitoring programs, which is there's a the more data you have, the more you understand the statistics, then you need to have sort of a somebody saying what's reasonable, right? At the end of all of that statistics, you know, what's the level of uncertainty that's going to be acceptable? We did a paper a few years ago where we had continuous perimeter land for gas monitoring and we compared it with the frequency of spot measurements required and we worked out that 75% of the time it was likely you would miss an exceedance using, you know, traditional spot measurement. So someone needs to start making a call on what's a reasonable probability of seeing that exceedance, if you know what I mean. Yeah, oh, it's the, the notion of mindless monitoring too, you know, is the monitoring actually <laughs> achieving anything? Exactly. Um, and and have, you, have you got enough data to understand and answer the question? So... Actually, having a well-defined question and intent for your monitoring is important. I really think that's where the regulators need to start focusing is how much data, what frequency, and maybe methodologies for determining that. We've had some great presentations on the webinars. There was one from uh, the Rivers Institute um, from Griffith University where they were talking about exactly that for water. It's not simple, right? But needs to be done. Otherwise, it is mindless monitoring. You're getting me ranting. Sorry, Paul. Um, next one. How is the daily calibration test of the instruments involved and addressed? Without getting down into tin tax, I'd say there's really that's got to be considered as a cost benefit. You know, what's the what's the risk? What's how well and reliable is the instrument you're using? Um, a consumer of the data, you know, why would you pay for it if there's no QA or calibration data available? You know, what what are you actually buying? So I think it's it's important that there's an appropriate level of um, assurance and integrity in the data capture. Um, but again, that that needs to be judged based on the on the the data, the instrument, the use of the data. Yeah, so there's an assumption there that all instruments need daily calibration, which isn't the case. Um, with continuous monitors, you can analyse for drift. And there's various sort of automations you can do 
and look at that data remotely to look for evidence of drift as an example. Um, I, look, I, I think anyone that's done a lot of monitoring, they, they will have had their own experiences with false positives and false negatives and um, and the lack of re reproducibility of results and, and understand some of those issues. There's a that's, that's why I thought I'd phrase the, you know, the, the response there is, a, is really a cost benefit. It, yeah. You've, you've got, to, got to understand why, what you're trying to achieve. It comes back to the question and and the circumstance. But a base level of assurance, I'd say, is is needed, yeah. depending on what, what you're doing. Most of the regs sort of, ref and, and sort of the way that, I guess, measurement organisations like us operate is, is based on uh, the manufacturer's recommendation is sort of the the recommendation that one puts forward. Um, so often the manufacturer, the sensor supplier will will have a recommended frequency of calibration. Uh, we better move on. Um, it would be great to hear of the pros and cons of remote sensing monitoring for these kinds of emissions. Oh, look, aerial and global coverage is, is great to shine a spotlight on things. Um, the sensitivity is getting up there. Um, the techniques and you know approach carbon map has taken to indicating persistence and doing that a bit more transparently, I think is good. Um, the remote sensing does struggle with the, the very you know, the lower concentration or diffuse the smaller diffuse area sources. Um, and there is still uncertainty in flux quantification. A lot of it comes down to just how um, how good are the models and the wind data that are that are fed into that post processing. Um, so that that's where um, I think some of the improvements are going to be made, and it will come back to higher frequency and and better wind data. I think to improve that, but it's it's great you know great to be able to see things. And be reproduced more frequently from a without having to trudge over a site for anyone that's walked over a fifty hectare landfill site, particularly an operating one knows. Okay. What are the triggers for a landfill gas risk assessment versus what risks can be qualitatively addressed? You need data to do a risk assessment. Uh, Before you can start making qualitative assessments, you need something. That, but that might be physical data, might not be concentrations, it might be the geology, distance, size of the landfill, but um, it's got to be data driven. Yeah, I suppose you can have these different sorts of data. So I guess the qualitative assessments based on that sort of data that's collected collected such as yeah geology might, might be yeah, might be helpful uh controversial maybe um i wouldn't i think a, saying something like it's an old landfill so it's going to be low risk or it's non-petrissible landfill so it's going to be low risk it probably um unsupported by the data <laughs> And that was because of poor control back in the day. Um, all right, let's move on. What is the criteria to stop monitoring legacy landfills? Oh, it depends on the risk and and the circumstances. That's that's a it's a very big question. You know, a change a change in use, change in a development against the boundary can can change the impact. Um, and the and the consequences of residual emissions from a landfill. Ultimately, is it an auditor's call? Oh, I think an auditor would say they'd be following guidance that the EPA provides them on how they conduct themselves. Ultimately, they've got to got to be prepared to to make and provide an opinion. Um, but I don't think the the guidance from the regulators is is probably um, it's, it's well it's not very prescriptive 
And so it it's a risk based decision at the end of the day. And I think um, depends on what the emissions are. So I'll say again, it would be data driven, and and what's the pathway? What's the receptor? What's the risk? Are you saying it's not a definitive criteria as such? You'd put forward a, a case, you'd say, look, these are the emissions and we don't think it's a big deal. We've done some kind of a risk assessment on that. Um, auditor has a look at that, goes to EPA, EPA say, okay, it's, is that sort of the scenario or is there something more definitive? You know, a, a very small landfill that was burnt historically, got a lot of soil in it. Yeah, might not be emitting much gas. Um, one that's a similar age, but you know, a hundred or a thousand times larger, might be quite different. Do you know of many landfills that have gone, like in the last twenty years, from operating to not needing monitoring, or in the, in the a whole length of your career? There's a couple. Um, some of that, I think some have fallen off the radar, probably not deliberately by accident in some jurisdictions. Some have just been lost in time. Um, some have been, um, yeah. Have the some of the monitoring has stopped, but I think who who holds the residual risk and whether it's been well managed or appropriately managed is probably still debatable in some cases. But but clearly we have experienced there's there's many un unmonitored old landfills around that are it's not evident they're causing impact. Uh, the impacts tend to manifest when there's development adjacent or on top of them. That's that tends yeah. to be the trigger of an issue. So you may think you can stop and then someone starts developing and you've got to start again. Um, all right, we better move on to the next dot point. Beyond primarily methane gas, are there technologies for fugitive emissions of other bulk gases such as carbon dioxide? Possibly. I think methane is probably a good proxy for landfills. Um, you know, there's CO2 present in the atmosphere as well in higher concentrations as background. Um, some trace gases like H2S can be used because they can be detected at quite low levels. Um, but no, methane's where the focus is. And it's, again, it's um, because of the focus on methane in other, other sectors, it means the technologies and techniques that are available. So um, we'll we piggyback off, off that work in the waste, waste space. Okay, now we're just moving on to the questions raised today. We are uh, two minutes from two o'clock, so we'll see if we can push through these, if this is all right, Paul. There seems yep. to be chap Alexander Williams. It's pretty passionate in this area. Thanks for these questions. Are the models empirical or numerically derived? Basically, with gas, I assume that all models are theoretical calculations based because of the difficulty in measurement in the past. How does current measurement technologies provide opportunities to improve models? Oh. I think that that's quite a broad question. I think the, the models problem with a lot of the models is the inputs, which are the waste composition inputs and the environmental conditions. Um, the the measurements, direct measurement, um, has a different range of issues because you're actually measuring something. So the, the opportunity to improve the models, I think uh, it's probably a different question. The, the measurement techniques mean you can unless you're calibrating something like an empirical model, um, which the, the Danish researchers have done, um, I'm not sure that directly improves the model other than it gives you an indication of the, the uncertainty or error in a model in a particular application. So. so it can help in the context if you're on one site 
and you've got a model that you're using every year, say, mm. and you've got some direct measurements, you could, yeah. I guess, look at some of the uncertainties. You're not, if it's a deterministic model and you're not fundamentally changing it or the inputs to the model, you just, um, it's just a calibration exercise. All right, good question there. Next question also from Alexander. Alexander's dominated. How could, <laughs> how could fixed or aerial monitoring techniques be employed in surface emissions monitoring across intermediate covered areas for compliance purposes? Noting the walking method is usually adopted to get five centimetres above ground surface, avoiding grass obstructions, etc. get a different question <laughs> um look i i think fixed set sensors because they're downwind it's going to be hard to identify whether you're just monitoring those different zones on the landfill they're going to be best done by a surface emission walkover um and not a not a fixed sensor or a remote sensor that's really looking at a whole of site so diff different question i think if you're looking at different zones on a landfill site I think they might be referring to drone mounted techniques with aerial. What's yeah, your look, I, I, I think you know high high density of of points across the surface will give you some better resolutions to where the the high concentrations are, are present. Okay. Alexander, again, for flux in kilograms per hour, we need to have the concentrations percentage and density kilograms per metre cubed and a flow rate metres cubed per hour. Noting many handheld monitors commercially available measure concentration, how do you quantify the flow rate? Good question. That's, I think, they probably covered that in the presentation that to convert those concentrations to a flux requires um, techniques, some of the which are, you know, sort of outlined. Um, and, you know, I think that that just goes to the yeah, what I've presented already. So yeah, probably answered that one in the presentation. All right. Last question from Alexander. Persistence, how frequently the plume gas occurs. Precision, how repeatable the results of the plume gas is measured using similar techniques? Question. So that's sort of a question of, you know, I guess, it, you've got the, you've got, is it there every time, you know, in reality? And then there's the precision of the instrument, like, is it's, persistence related to the precision of the instrument I think I, look I, th I think I think it is particularly where the detection limits are high which yeah. was the point I was trying to draw out between the satellite and aerial based measures that the reported persistence might reflect the the detection limit not the actual persistence of the emission yeah Robert Miller food organics being driven from landfill by the fear of methane production no one mentions gas collection as an offset any sign of gas reduction due to diversion uh yes it's well it's co commonly done to and the offsets are created and it's measurable a large measurable impact occurs at landfill due to the capture and uh, diversion of gas into a into a combustion process um, you think any sign of gas reduction due to diversion? Do they mean diversion of food organics going into the landfill in the first place? Yeah, oh, look, there is, but it's um, it it is harder to see. You don't see an immediate response because the emissions from waste that has been disposed historically is still occurring. So, um, yes, that's a that's a an action that can have a future impact in in avoiding emissions. Um, but today, it is important to capture the gap, the emissions that are currently occurring as well. It's not do one or do the other, it's do both. Okay. Alexander Williams, I thought he was finished, but there's another one. 
How does satellite-based measurement work? Is the satellite using solar reflection from the site? Yeah, the this this uh, the the current ones are um, lidar or laser-based systems can be used as well, but most of them are uh, using reflected solar radiation currently. Sophie Wood wants to know what methods are Australian landfills currently using? Predominantly, it's surface emissions monitoring with um, and the flux estimation or the total emission estimates are, are almost universally based on a model. There's no direct measurement. I'm, I've seen one report attempting to do a direct measurement in Australia so far. There may be others, but they're just not public. Which site was that? Uh, look, I think CSIRO did a an investigation of some mining operations around the Newcastle Hunter Valley area and included a landfill as part right. of that study. Heath Thatcher says, has open path FTIR been used, considered for landfill gas monitoring? Uh, yes, it has been. Yeah, it is. It is or has been used to identify vision, you know, to to map emissions on sites, not not to quantify them. We actually used a similar method to that to look at emissions across lagoons, sewage lagoons. Um, all right. Well, that brings us to the end of the questions. Paul, you've done very well there. Many many questions. Um, really like just to thank you for your presentation today uh, obviously really interesting to a lot of people who are here today so thanks very much oh thanks richard and yeah appreciate the the roll up today it was uh, and the and the questions thanks paul thanks richard